Hello Shiloh, we're going to begin the service soon, so find your seat. Outside, please come in. Bring them in. The people outcast. Bring them in, please. Hello, Joe. The newborn baby, only 100 days now, her age is. Now is the time to worship. Uh, let's pray. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for gathering us before your altar. We come before you. We come before you who count us to the bat. At this time, in this place, Father, we want not to see ourselves but to see only you. When we have looked back our last week, we could say words of complaining, disappointing, regret, and failure, but we will not. Instead of those mumblings, we give you the fruit of our lips, the praise of our lips. Father, command peace in us and accept our praise and our worship. We want to meet Jesus, only Jesus. And you want to have your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing, We Bring the Sacrifice of Praise. I know there's only a few people. Oh, lots of keys too. I know, I know it, but how about let's stand up. Let's stand up together, stand up. Stand up please and with clap and with your voice. Let's sing. We bring the sacrifice of praise.
Let's sing. My heart sings praises.
that we offer up the fruit of our lips, the praise of our lips. Amen. Okay, please sit. Find your seat, please. We don't need to see the roaring, roaring sea. Is that right? We don't need to see the roaring sea. We just see, we just look at Jesus Christ who stands on the sea. Let's pray for that for our nations wherever, where, wherever you are from. And let's pray for our church, what situation we are in. It doesn't matter. We just look at our, our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we, let's pray for our Shiloh. Please pray for Evangelist Trina. She will speak. Father, please put your Holy Spirit on her and speak through her. Let's pray for that. And then pray for Pastor John McCauley, Oh Min Sik, Roxanne, Jessica Hemming, Madeline, Elders Madeline's family in Malaysia, Kimberly, Seth O's mother. Oh, my age is, I think, 44 years now, I think. My age is 44. And I see her, Joe, today for the first time in my life. And I waited, I have waited 44 years to see her. <laughs> oh, thanks, God. <laughs> Okay, that, uh, let's sing that kind of things. We're going to sing, we sing Hallelujah together and then pray together.
together. Shout Amen only three times. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to worship you on this Lord's Day. Father, we thank you for keeping us and bringing us safely to this place of worship. And we also thank you for protecting our family, our church, and our nations throughout the past week. Father, we, as we look back upon our lives during the past week, please forgive all the transgressions we may have committed knowingly and unknowingly. Please help us that our hearts will not be hardened by this wicked world. We pray that you will lead evangelist Joanna Pe when she gives us the message. May all the saints of Shiloh receive your abundant blessing through the word that you give us today. We pray all these in the blessed name of our Lord Jesus Christ with thanksgiving. Amen.
The bread of life today comes from one place in the Bible. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 2 through 3. Once again, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 2 through 3. That Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came, and I, I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. They said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. This is the word of God. Amen. We'll all have the choral anthem titled, Holy Like You.
Evangelist Joanna Pei will come up to give us the sermon titled Starting the Rebuilding of the City Walls of Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Yeah. Um, uh, last Saturday, we had this special blessing of going up to Mount Jiri. And for somebody who's so out of shape like me, um, <laughs> The Cheonang Peak was an, an impossible goal, really. And you can tell here from my sister, I was very scared, actually. Um, and so I realized there's a special message for me personally by going up to Jerry with Shiloh members, because this is my first time. And um, I realized this morning, or this afternoon, <laughs> when we were worshiping, Mount Jerry is known as a very spiritual mountain in Korea. And a lot of people do ascend the mountain for very special reasons. And I realized that we had the experience of climbing up this tough mountain together, although we were at all different levels. Somebody was fit, somebody was like me, um, but we all made it up there solely by the grace of God. And it reminds me today, Father has given us that experience and blessing because every Lord's Day, we can climb up the spiritual mountain Zion, and we are going to strengthen one another, like our praise team did and our beautiful choir team. We all strengthen one another so we can climb up this hill that seems impossible to us. Amen. And I believe today is um, one of those just beautiful day of uh, confession of faith. Thank you so much. Um, and the message is actually pretty um, inspiring. It's about the beginning of the rebuilding the city walls of Jerusalem, where rebuilding means it was broken down. That's already heartache right there. Um, but before we begin, I want to remind all of us that Israel's history in this Bible is not just a history, right? It is the blueprint of our journey of faith to kingdom of heaven. And our senior pastor, Reverend Evan Park, likened Israelites' probably most tragic history where they were taken to Babylonian captivity. And he likened the return from the captivity to our restoration, our restoration to the original state of creation. So it's not just a history in the past. It has a message for all of us today. And we will note that there were three stages of return from the Babylonian captivity, right? And that means God has planned for us three different stages of our return to the original state of creation, how we were supposed to be. Isn't that exciting, right? And so uh, let's start with reminding us of these three stages in the Babylonian return from the Babylonian captivity, okay? And I'm going to uh, list the years and who were the leaders and what kind of mission they accomplished. First is First return was in 537 BC. Now, BC means 537 years before Jesus Christ came. Okay? The leader at the time was Zerubbabel, and they were able to build a temple. Second return after they finished building the temple was in 458 BC. Not many people returned this time from Babylon, but this was a time where Ezra, the scribe, the man who was um, well-versed in the law of God. He returned and he um, revived people's faith in the covenant. As you can see already, many years have passed. From 537 BC to 458 BC, right? Nearly 100 years have passed, right? So long years have passed and people were growing weary and tired, exhausted. Please note, even after the temple was built, and from there, we come to today's scene. It's in 444 BC, the event that directly triggered the third return. Now for this return who came was the man named Nehemiah. He was a famous cupbearer of the king Artaxerxes, right? Now he comes and he's the one who builds the city walls. And we're going to talk about what triggered this third part, third, trigger, uh, third return to take place. But I want us to note this. Even after the temple was built, 
in 516 BC, right? The city did not exist because there is no wall. So History Redemption series points out this time structure in the Bible where we didn't see before. Okay. We say, okay, first return, second return, third return, 537, 458, 444 BC. We memorize that, right? But there's three-dimensional time frame. For 72 years, even after temple was built, there were long years of frustration for people who believed in God. That means a lot to us, right? This temple was restored in 70 years after its devastation uh, to its reconstruction, 70 years, okay? And after the temple was finished, there were 72 more years of frustration until the city was complete. And we will see why the city is very important, okay? First of all, let's look at what kind of state these walls were in in 444 BC. We often, I thought that today's main passage that our presider kindly read for us was from the, uh, during the first return when everything was devastated or maybe 586 BC. I think it was the time when it actually burned in the fire first time, but it wasn't, okay? So Nehemiah chapter one opens with Hanani's report. Hanani comes all the way to Nehemiah who was in Susa, the palace of the Persian king, Artaxerxes, right? So it's a long way of traveling. And Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity about Jerusalem. And verse 3, they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. So to Nehemiah, his brothers, his people were in great reproach because the walls of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So even after the temple was built, and after the second return, right, with, with Ezra, there had been so much effort in rebuilding or repairing the broken gates of the wall of Jerusalem. But it failed again and again and again. And this time when Hanani is saying the walls were broken down, the word broken down in Hebrew is parats, in pool participial form, means it's a very a passive but emphasis, intensive. Okay, somebody destroyed them. Right? And also the word um, means completely destroyed and abandoned. The word br burned with fire in the Hebrew word is yatsat. It's also a nifal passive stem with a fire. So these two words are not just to read. It actually embodies great stress and distress and agony, anguish in the heart. It is broken down. It's burned with fire over and over again because of the interferences. So can you imagine the heart of the people who tried so hard, right, to accomplish God's mission, and yet again and again, it falls into failure. And all they see left in front of their eyes is burnt down wall. That is where today's scene begins. So this report from Hanani is what triggers the third return, the historical return from the Babylonian captivity. So let's go to point number two, the history of the city walls. I tried to mark the answers in the orange, and later on I kind of lose a track of it, so it gets everywhere, <laughs> but, but please um, stop me if you ha don't have the answers, okay? So let's look at the point two, the history of the city walls. First, now we're tracing back time. When was a wall first broken down? That's all the way back in 586 BC, okay? When people were deported to Babylon during the third stage, that's when the walls. So for example, city walls means like, in Seoul we have Namdaemun, um, what's the other gates, I don't know. We have gates in, as a historical sites, right? These were like city walls that protected the city. And people can only come through these doors, okay? And these were all burnt down, right? So that's what it means. So 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 10 backs it up. So the army of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, who were with the captain of the guard, broke down the walls around Jerusalem. This is 586 BC, during the third captivity, deportation to Babylon. Now, so I marked on the timeline. So 586 BC is when the temple and the city walls were all destroyed for the first time. Okay. And then... Um, after they return the first time, OK, 
Okay? They complete the temple finally, despite all the interferences. That's in 516 BC. Okay? So point number two, after the first return of the temple was completed in 516 BC. Now that is after, uh, okay, this is the verse, Ezra 6, verse 15. So note, it's Ezra, okay? The temple was completed on the third day of month of Adar. It was the sixth year of the reign of the king Darius, which was 516 BC. So before this happened, in 537 BC was the first return, right? And then we come to 516 BC is when the temple was built, All right? And today's report, Hanani comes and says, this city walls are burnt with fire, right? Repeatedly, that is right here, 444 BC. Okay, so if you count from the time when the temple or the city walls were first destroyed, how many years has the Jerusalem been without its walls? 142 years. Okay. City walls means everything about the protection and safety of the city. Actually, it, equal, it is equated to the, in, uh, the identity of the city itself. What this points to us is that temple alone does not suffice. When there's temple of God, there has to be city walls around it, right? That's the important part. And so the amazing part is, you remember how God said the temple will be rebuilt or the Jerusalem will be restored in 70 years? He prophesied that before the people were taken to Babylon. That means God set his time exactly when he's going to let the people loose to the captivity, when he's going to bring them back. Same way, God has already set his time to when he's going to rebuild his wall. That has already been prophesied by prophet Daniel. Okay, Daniel was a man who was in time of Darius and Cyrus, right? During the um, first return. So let's look at this verse. Daniel prophesied that the city of Jerusalem would be rebuilt in the 70-week revelation. Oh. So you will see the point here is that what we need to build now is not just a temple, but the city of Jerusalem. Okay? And so Daniel 9 verse 25 says this. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree. So a king will issue a decree to restore and rebuild the Jerusalem. Now, this here, Jerusalem is referring to the actual city, not just a temple, okay? Until Messiah the Prince. There will be how many weeks? Seven weeks plus 62 weeks. So it's not total 70 weeks yet. It's total 69 weeks until the Messiah the Prince comes. He has set the time. And it will be built again. And here it gets specific that we are talking about the city, not the temple. Because it says, it will be built again with plaza and moat. What is plaza and moat? Okay, it's not something that's found in the temple, but in the city itself. So if we refer to New Living Translation version, you'll see um, here, Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets, right? And with a strong defenses, despite the hardships, right? So here, this Daniel's profound revelation for when these things will be restored reveals the exact timing that God has already planned, okay? And it will take 79 weeks before the decree to rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah. Building of city of Jerusalem is this important that God will come and prophesy about it in relation to the emergence of Jesus Christ. Okay. So then let's kind of, this is the hard part, let's do some math. This decree, right, that Daniel received as a prophecy, who is this king and when was this decree issued? Who, which king decreed that city of Jerusalem will be built again? That was none other than Cyrus is decree in the second return. Okay, this was in the second return. So that is what year? 458 BC. 458 BC. Okay, so this is after the temple is built, right? So let's 
let's see, uh, look at the timeline again. Um, so here, 516 BC is when Zerubbabel's temple is complete, right? First return, after the first return. And then when Cyrus decrees to, for, to rebuild the city of New Jerusalem is in 458 BC. So imagine, the temple is already finished, right? So what people need to build now is the city, the wall of Jerusalem. So the effort, dire effort to rebuild the city walls has already begun in 458 BC when the king issued a decree, right? So here by this verse, the Bible is pointing out that for 72 years, there was no walls to protect the temple of God. And then in 458 BC, when Cyrus decrees, then the partial construction of the walls began, but to repeated failure, one after the other. And so we see today in Hanania's report in 444 BC, right? So that the gates are burned down in fire. It's broken down. So that's been, even after the second return, right? Even when the king says, go and rebuild, there's still so much oppositions and resistance and hindrances for 14 years. So counting all, even after the temple was built, no wall to protect the temple for 86 years. I found this very, very comforting. I don't know about you, but I was so blessed. I realized we focus so much on the building the temple part, right? The temple symbolizes my God's presence in my life. So me and God together, we have relationship. I go see him, he talks to me, we have relationship, that's what temple is. I thought that was everything. There is something more to build after that. I wonder why even after I have relationship with God, I keep stumbling and fall and doubt and get swayed by all this external or internal hindrances, right? And the history of Israel proves that this happened exactly the same in history, right? For 86 years, even after the temple is here, people will falter and stumble because there's nothing to protect, right? So it is very important that we build the city walls of Jerusalem. Building the temple is the beginning, very strong beginning, foundation, but we have to together build the city walls around for ultimate protection. Okay. And I, I found this as much comfort because it actually took longer to build the city walls than, or, or not, no, it took only 50 days to build the city wall once they set my, their mind to it, but it, the period of being without the city wall was longer than the period of, without, period of being without the temple itself. Does that make sense? Without the temple, 70 years. Without the wall, 86 years. So take courage. Even if you're like not on par on your walk of faith, don't worry. Because it's already been written in the Bible. This time is here for sure for a reason. And we are in the progress of reconstructing, repairing the city walls together. Amen? Okay. So, and the amazing part is that the city wall will be rebuilt according to God's precise timing, according to his prophecy and providence. And that, we go back for that, we go back to um, uh, Daniel's prophecy, okay? But for reference first, it's not in your um, lecture notes, but 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 to 4 tells us that Jesus Christ, everything that he ever did, his coming, his leaving, everything on his earth was according to the scriptures, right? Everything has been already prophesied. That's what it means. So how precise is God's timing? Well, if you go to Luke chapter 3, verse 23, you might see that, you see that verse in your lecture note, right? Luke 3, verse 23, it, it presents to us a very important timing in life of Jesus, so when he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being as was opposed the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, okay? So this is the age when Jesus began his public ministry as the anointed, as the Messiah. And that is in, he was born in 4 BC, right? So what year would that be? 30 years later, after Jesus was born, 
Okay, so we have to go across the BC to AD region, right? So that will be 26 AD. Jesus began his public ministry in 26 AD. And it perfectly fits the prophecy of Daniel. Going back to Daniel's prophecy, Daniel 9 verse 25, we said seven weeks and 62 weeks, right? This is a part of the total 70-week uh, revelation to the all the time to the end. And we can't talk about it all t today, but just for the first part, the seven weeks and 62 weeks. So if you see here, seven weeks here, right? So weeks means week, like seven days in a week, right? So seven weeks is seven times seven. So how many days? 49 days right here, okay? And then 62 weeks means seven times, weeks is seven days, right? Again, seven times 62, we have 434 days, right? And so when, is, when does seven weeks start and 62 weeks start? Well, God said here in this verse, it's from the time the king decrees to rebuild Jerusalem until when? Until here, the Messiah, the prince, comes. And if you count from 458 BC, when Cyrus decrees to rebuild Jerusalem, and because God says one day is like a year to him, right? Um, if you count from that 458 BC, 26 AD is exactly 483 years. Because if you add, okay, let me go back. 49 uh, here, 49 plus 434 is 483, right? So together it's 483. If you count from 458 BC up to 26 AD, then you get 483. Am I, did, did I lose you? Okay, it's, it might be a little too small. I'm sorry. Okay. So counting from, so God prophesied the Cyrus decrees to rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah will come. There will be 69 weeks, which will be 483. Okay. But in truth, in history, King Cyrus decreed in 480, 458 B.C., and if you count every year from that time until Jesus Christ emerged as a Messiah, starting his public ministry in 26 AD, that is exactly 483 years. Okay. Our God is very precise. And please note, this time counting begins with rebuilding the city wall of Jerusalem. That's how much building the city walls of Jerusalem is very, very important to God himself. And God who set his mind and set his time to rebuild the city wall of Jerusalem also has a timing for you and me. After he initiated this relationship with us by what grace we cannot fathom. But he guarantees I will also cause everything to work together to build the protective wall around the city of peace that I'm going to finish through you. Amen? So... And also, at the time, the history of the gate is that there were four gates that had already been erected. So people have been trying very hard to rebuild the city wall, right? So for reference, if you count um, two gates, Ephraim and corner gate, there will be a total of six gates. So we have this picture here. This is what it means. This is what the Jerusalem looked like, okay? And the verses in your lecture note actually points to these gates. So there are a total of four gates already established, right? So first, Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 26 tells us that there is a water gate. Okay. And then Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 28 through 29, talks about the horse gate and the east gate. And then on the top, um, Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 31, talks about the inspection gate. Okay. So these four gates were already there. Plus, if you look at um, Ezra, there are other gates like Ephraim gate here and also corner gate. So by the time Hanani comes make this report, by the time Nehemiah says, okay, I need to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city wall, there were already six gates established, but not all of them yet. So when they come, and later on you will study more, after how many 84 years of not having walls, right? This man, Nehemiah, comes, and he brings all the people together and rebuilds 
this dire wish of our God, the city walls in just 52 days. That's what this is amazing. So these are the gates he comes to rebuild. Okay. Um, you see, sheep gate, and these are the uh, tower of the hundred, tower of the Hananel. This will all be in the year 11th book. And fish gate. So the meanings of the gate is quite amazing. I, um, old gate. Okay, and then the Tower of Furnaces, there are towers here too, and then Valley Gate. So they come and make all these refuse gate. Refuse means like dung, okay, and Fountain Gate, okay. All these gates are repaired when the Nehemiah returns. Don't these gates seem striking to you? So these walls are built to protect me and God, my relationship, right? Or our relationship with God, the temple. But they have gates. So our God is not about to build a hermit kingdom around you. Let me say, our choir is saying, be holy like you, you know? So we are set apart from the world, right? But that doesn't mean you have to be like a hermit kingdom where nobody gets out, nobody gets in, right? There are gates. That means there's influx. Things from the outer world will have to come in. We also go out. That's a blessing of coming in and going out. Okay. We are to exist vibrantly, to breathe together with the world, not to be fallen apart, not to be dissipated, not to be drowning in the world, right? But we will have gates where we will have everything under our control. Right. Two, for the ultimate ministry that we have received, right? To reconcile the world to God himself. That's what these gates mean, okay? So you're not gonna be secluded in this mountain or in this hermit kingdom as a Christian, okay? We will have a, a exchange, we will have uh, interactions with the world. Ultimate purpose is to reconcile the world to our God. Or we don't have city walls just to, so that I can be protected and I don't care what happens to other people. You see what I'm saying? So all these gates are there for that purpose. So I want you to uh, draw your attention to this verse, reference verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through 19. This is a ministry that we have received. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation means Shiloh, bring peace, make peace. Enemies becoming friends again. Verse 19, that is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So until we become strong enough to take on the world, right, there will be times we'll falter, we get confused, we can doubt, we can drown, but let us not lose our heart. Amen? Okay, everything is happening according to God's timetable. And we will become strong city of peace to bring peace to the world. So what brought these rebuilding of the city temple to take place? The causal factors are, first of all, Hanani's report. As you see on your lecture note, name Hanani means grace, a gracious. Okay? He is a man of, who is commended so much. In Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1 through 2, it says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, now it happened in the month of Kislev in the 20th year while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came. In verse 2, Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 2, Nehemiah introduces Hanani as my brother. And Hanani, Hananiah, the commander of the fortress in charge of Jerusalem, that he was faithful man and feared God more than many. This is who Hanani was. Okay. First of all, he possessed a faith that Put, was put into action. So he didn't just talk about it. He actually uh, worked. He had an action. So Hanani came to Nehemiah to the palace of Susa in Persia, which is about 1,600 kilometers away from Judah, to resolve the country's crisis. Okay. I'm sure there were everybody else depressed in that town, right? And But Hanani, his heart was bursting. His Coming to Susa was an explosion of many, many, many years of frustration, of trying to build a temple, this wall, 
and failing over and over again. So James chapter 2, verse 26 reminds us that our faith is faith with works. Because like a, a body without spirit is dead, right? In the same way, faith without works is also dead. So Hanani had this faith of carrying it out into action. Also, Hanani f- had God-fearing faith. Um, in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11, Nehemiah prays for Hanani and his member. And he says, O Lord, I beseech you, you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name. And this is referring to Hanani and the people who came. What is fearing God? Is it fearing God is like, if I don't do something, then he's going to punish me, or if I do something good, then he's going to bless me? Okay. Here, fearing God are people who delight in revering his name. Fearing God is people who delight in knowing him because his name represents God himself. The name is no, uh, none other than the Lord Yahweh. Right? So this is the definition of God-fearing faith. Hanani had an intimate relationship with God who feared, revered his name, right? I mean, when we call, like, um, my sister's here, so I keep talking about her, but uh, she's a twin. So we have a brother, Dustin, and we have sister, Diana. And when my mom calls them, her voice is so different. So Diana's very strong, and, you know, like, she's always <clears throat> to the point, And she's, you know, not, she's, not, she's not scared of anything. Dustin, on the other hand, please don't tell him that I said I talked about him, but he's more like the, the, the feminine side, <laughs> the boy. So he's always quiet and very, you know, friendly, right? So when my mom calls uh, Diana, she's like, mom's like, Diana, Diana, you know, like that tone with it, right? Her name is always associated with that strength, Diana, right? But for my brother, she's like, Dusty. <laughs> so we always make joke about that, right? How do we revere God's name? How do we call him? Right? It's a very intimate. How we call our beloved, it's, we use our names, right? Right? We don't call him like Diana, right? <laughs> right? Okay. Thank you, sisters. <laughs> okay. So Hanani had this God-fearing faith. Now, what about Nehemiah? This lesson actually blew me away because we're talking about this national crisis. Countries, countries matter, right? But the people who emerge here is two people, Hanani and Nehemiah. Few people can change the course of history. Few people's prayer can bring about great blessings for the all people, right? And I think with that vision, Father had called you and me here. So let's look at Nehemiah's prayer. He says, when I heard these words, how the gates were burned down, and their efforts were repeatedly failing. I sat down and wept and mourned four days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So Hanani's heart, looking at the gate, God's heart, looking at this broken wall, and Nehemiah's heart at this great devastation, they all came together. This is great synergy, right? So here, Nehemiah, only one person but he offers up this prayer of repentance. So the answer is repentance. And he says, let your, let your ear now be attentive and your eye open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants. What does he do first? He strips naked before God. Please, God, take me as who I am, for I'm confessing the sins of the sons of Israel confessing the sins that we have done against you, I am my father's house. So when something goes wrong, the very first thing that brought, was brought to Nehemiah's mind was, we have done something wrong, right? We need to rectify the situation with God. And he remembers that it is our sin that caused this great devastation. And I pray that Although we may be one person that's representing our family, we may be that small citizen who's not significant, who may not seem significant in this whole nation, but our prayer, when we pray on behalf of our members of family, our members of the church, or members of our country, God listens when we repent, okay? 
And so 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, God promises that when my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, I will hear. And I will heal. And Psalm 32, verse 5, David says, I acknowledge my sin to you. Sometimes we hold it in. We don't really talk about these issues with God, you know. But I think we need to invest our time to just to strip naked before God and to say, God, this is who I am. I'm sorry. This is, I can't go any further. And I'm so sorry for all these mistakes or whatever that we know is holding us back. And here, you forgave the guilt of my sin. Selah prayed. Secondly, Nehemiah prayed based on the word. This is the importance of our understanding of the word. Word is truly the weapon. Okay. So Nehemiah prayed, says, I know our people have utterly sinned, but God, please remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses many, many, many years ago. If you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the people. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those who have, you have not, uh, and though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote part of the heavens, I will gather them again. This is God's prayer. I mean, God's promise. Okay. So can Shiloh also hold on to this promise? Can we also take actions like Hanani? Can we also pray like Nehemiah? I think that's the way our Father has taught us to be. This word is based on Deuteronomy 30, verse 1 through 4. Okay, I will not read this. But this, Deuteronomy 30, 30 verse 1 through 4, is all about returning to God. If we just return to God, he will do what we ask for and much more than we can ever ask for. Okay, so we see... You return to the Lord, and third uh, verse 3, then Lord your God will restore you from your captivity. And even if there are outcasts, if there, even if there are many problems, mentally, physically, spiritually, and whatnot, we will be restored. And finally, this Nehemiah's prayer was very, very specific to seek God's favor. When he prayed, he knew at the time the person who can make rebuilding the wall happen was none other than this king out of Xerxes, to whom he was bearing cups, wine, pouring wines for the king, right? And so here, Nehemiah prayed specifically, God, grant me favor from this king out of Xerxes. That's in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11. Oh Lord, I beseech you. And then if you go down here, make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Okay, now I was a cupbearer to the king. So here Nehemiah prays this man. This man is none other than King Artaxerxes. Here this, um, our book uh, breaks it down. It is actually an expression saying this man right here. So this ha is a referential pronoun and ze is definite article. So it means this man. And this is precisely referring to King Artaxerxes or his name is also known as Longjumanus. Okay, he's ruled from Persia. This is the man whom um, Nehemiah was with at the time. Okay. So thanks to Hanani's report, Nehemiah gets all stirred up. And he repents for his sins, his family's sins, his countrymen's sins. right? And he prays, God, grant me a favor from this king. But did you know, this is the very king, the same king who stopped the construction of the wall. It's like going into the face of the enemy, right? And our God make things happen. This is truly a miracle. Okay. So this king was the one who had halted the construction of the walls in the past. And these are the verses in your lecture note. Ezra chapter 4, verse 7. So we're now back into the book of Ezra. Okay, that's the man of the second return. And saying so the days of Artaxerxes, okay, um, wrote these men, wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Okay, they were complaining. You know, these Jews came along, and then they, they finished the temple. Now they're trying to build these walls. I mean, how um, uh, blaspheming is this in front of our king, right? How can they build the city walls around you to keep you outside? You shouldn't let them stop it. So this was the um, accusations against them. 
So Ezra chapter 4 verse 12 says, let it be known to the king. Okay. These, they are building this rebellious and evil city, and they're finishing the walls and repairing the foundation. So they're telling to Artaxerxes. Verse 13, it says, let it be known to the king. So this king is Artaxerxes. Okay. And verse 17, so the king sent an answer. Okay. The answer is verse 21 to 23. So now issue a decree to make these men stop work that the city may not be rebuilt until a decree is issued by me. So he's the one who stopped it. And Nehemiah is the one who made the same man to revert his decree and to say, let these men rebuild the city of Yahweh. Okay. So, First, uh, point number four, it says, Nehemiah specifically prayed that God would move King Artaxerxes' heart because he had to get permission to rebuild the wall again from the King Artaxerxes who had halted his construction of the wall in the past. And the lesson from this is this. Prayer will be surely answered when we seek with a very specific goal in mind. We all have goals. The question is, what kind of goals? How sink are we with the heart of God? If our mind, our thoughts, our plans, our goals are aligned with God's, we can be like the single man, Nehemiah, who can bring about great historical change or restoration. We don't need to blame on other people. We don't need to be depressed because other people, or even myself, is not doing so well. Okay? We can be that solution. Or we can be that weapon to bring about great change. Okay. I believe that is why our Father God is teaching us this message today. Okay. So Matthew 7, verse 7, Jesus encouraged us to ask. It will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened. And also 9, verse 11 says, Because what man is there among you who when your son if he asks for, Daddy, can I have a loaf of bread? What daddy will give him a snake instead? Okay. And for verse 11, if you then, being so evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? So here are good things here. We may have varying list of things that we want from God. But Jesus actually explained it in Luke Chapter 11, verse 13. What this good thing the Father wants to give us. What is good? Luke 11, verse 13. Shall we read this first together? Okay, ready, begin. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give? The Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Let us ask for the Holy Spirit so that we can truly pray for us and our families, our beloved church, and our nation. Okay. Let us ask for the Holy Spirit so we can be the few that can bring around great restoration, a fulfillment of God's pleasing will. Let's, have a, let's ask for the Holy Spirit so when we pray, we are so aligned with our God's heart so that even our enemies will turn back and help us. Amen? So, a final verse, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7. Okay. I believe that this is the blessing that we ought to enjoy for the rest of our lives. This is the blessing that we as a people of Pyongyang have received. Okay. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7. Let's read together. Ready, begin. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Come on, Shiloh. Shalom means those who bring peace. Amen? This is what we do. Let us be the spiritual Hanani, spiritual Nehemiah. Amen? Let's close with prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much for digging up these hidden gems and the past history in the Bible. We never knew that what the Israelites had gone through is exactly what's happening in our journey of faith right now. Father, if there are any members among Shalom who is despairing, heartbroken, because 
even though we have relationship with God, it seems like we are faltering, drowning, and tripping, and stumbling over and over again. You know what we're going through right now. And the name Nehemiah means comfort. I believe that the name Nehemiah represents your comfort for us and also your vision for us to become that few who can bring about global change around the world for your glory. Father, help us to stand up by shaking up our feeble knees to stand tall and firmly trust in the word of the covenant that through you I will surely be glorified and help us be diligent like Nehemiah and his men who built the city walls in 52 days by holding the word in one hand and holding um, and by repairing the wall on one hand and holding the weapon on the other. And we believe the weapon you have given us is a word of God. So help us to finish this divine duty of building up this broken walls and gates that may be around us. Thank you for empowering us once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give all the glory to our Father God. Thank you, Evangelist, for the precious word. Remembering the grace, let us sing hymn number 506. Let us bow our heads for offering prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for filling our hearts with your precious word. May your word alone reign over our hearts, body, and soul. Father God, we are living in the world full of hardships and temptations. Please help us to overcome all the tribulations and problems. Father, we have no one but you upon whom to rely and we are trusting you for our provision today. As we give our tithes and thanksgiving offerings for the grace and love you have poured upon us, may our offerings be used in glorifying your eternal name and expanding your heavenly kingdom. Believing that you will listen to all we have asked for, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.
Do we have any visitors today? Yes, uh, we have one visitor from uh, New York Evergreen Church, uh, Eldress uh, in Gyeong Park. Please stand. <laughs> <laughs> Let's greet her with a welcome song. Uh, please to, uh, turn to your bulletins or we'll look at the screen for the announcements. Okay, the first one, Pyongyang Jail Leadership. Uh, let us continue to pray, pray for God's will to realize uh, through this election process. Uh, secondly, uh, Pyongyang Day, officially May 17th is Pyongyang Day, but the Thanksgiving wor worship service will be held during this upcoming Thursday service on the 19th. Uh, let us pray and prepare our hearts with thanksgiving. Uh, Barrett graduation, uh, the Barrett Theological Seminary graduation ceremony will also be held during this Thursday, Thursday's worship service on May 19th, uh, 2022. Uh, congratulations to Shiloh's own Deacon Andrew Kim and Anna Park who will be graduating. The next one, John Ross Visitor Center and Abraham Park Library. Pastor James Park attended the opening of the John Ross Visitor Center and Abraham Park Library. It will also have an exhibit dedicated for our founding pastor, Reverend Abraham Park. Uh, next one is a Thursday night Bible study. Every Thursday night at, at 9 p.m., uh, Pastor James leads online Bible studies on Book 11, Volume 2, Jerubbabel's Temple. Uh, this is followed by a short prayer session. Also, the book, booklets are available at the Shiloh office for 7001 for purchase. Recruiting volunteers. If you are interested in volunteering in Shiloh, choir, subtitling, etc., please speak to General Secretary David Son. Uh, we especially need volunteers to help with English subtitles for Shiloh service. Saturday morning Bible study. Shiloh Sanctuary is open for Bible study gathering. Please come to Shiloh and worship together every Saturday morning at 11 a.m. Uh, the last one, the Bible scripture reading is from 2 Chronicles chapter 18 uh, through Ezra chapter 3. There are no further announcements. Uh, please rise and let us sing hymn number six. <laughs> conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Please take me our praises and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us from temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
teacher, a teacher of the Lord's Day, so we would like to thank our ministers. We will give Evangelist Joy and our token of gratitude. Thank you.